I'm Ed Amoroso from Tag Cyber, and I'm here with a longtime friend, John Viega, who is the founder and CEO of Capsule 8 right here in New York City. Hey, John. Hey, Ed. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming by. It's going to be um, fun to hear about uh, what you guys are doing in production Linux and some trends you see. But why don't you share with the folks watching just briefly what you guys do at Capsule 8, and then we can dig into the technology. Yeah, sounds good. At uh, Capsule 8, we protect modern Linux infrastructure, whether it be on cloud or containers or in the data center. And we do that uh, with a runtime security that uh, protects against uh, everything from uh, zero days to more mundane uh, kind of uh, TTPs, uh, misuse of your systems. Like we mm -hmm. catch a lot of people doing things they shouldn't be doing, like debugging in production, for instance. Mm -hmm. So production Linux is your, that's where you guys 100%, are. and uh, we are uh, kind of focused on every Linux environment in a way that is very easily portable across them and doesn't put any risk to the operational environment, and that's a, a, a very big deal for our customers. Uh, the the way we got started i mean there are a bunch of different origin stories but uh, one of the big ones was my last company got acquired and i ended up picking up a large managed security services provider mm. in europe and had a bunch of companies saying hey uh, can you do some edr for our production linux infrastructure uh, edr endpoint detection response endpoint detection and response and uh, we thought yeah, that should be easy. All these EDR vendors have Linux products, and we tested them all out and uh, started pilots with a couple of these customers, and they all had the wrong, like, the wrong model. They drove up <laughs> operational costs. They like, would yeah. crash busy systems and uh, slow things down. Slow, uh, slow things down, and uh, you know, the, uh, we, all the trials we did, our, the partner customers said, no way, take this thing out. And uh, that, that was kind of one of the seeds for the company. And when we started, and I started interviewing uh, people that are CISOs in large companies asking about their Linux footprint and how they expect that to move to cloud and containers, we heard a lot of the security forward companies saying the same thing. We, we, we really feel like there's a problem to be solved here, and we've tried a bunch of different EDR solutions, and can't make any of them work for us. So instead, what happened was they started focusing on investing more in the SDLC, like the assurance of what they put into production, uh, because that's the only thing that didn't come with a massive amount of operational risk. <laughs> so. You know, it's funny, but for, for me personally, I spent a lot of my career securing operating systems. Yep. And in the early days, it was procedural. Mm -hmm. you'd, you'd buy these books or you'd, you'd get these manuals or you'd, you'd apprentice with someone. Right. And it was this craft of how you configured and managed and administered. In those days, we'd say a Unix system, I'd say Linux. But right. what, how, what's sort of the balance? Because I'm, imag I'm imagining that with Capsule 8, there's still probably some manual things you need to do. But what, what do you recommend to people? Do you, you just install Capsule 8 and you're good? Or is it, what, what's the process of securing the yeah. system? It's a good question. So we have uh, kind of a couple of different, uh, call it packagings. One we call, or I call the IPS packaging, which yeah. means uh, detection in real time and protection for stuff that we're really confident our models are so accurate that you could just kind of fire and forget. Like you yeah. don't have to configure it, it works the same everywhere. And then there are kind of, there's the policy capabilities which are uh, much more environmentally dependent. Yeah. You know, the, the, what the workload is. Mm. You can't kind of generically say how the file system should be used across mm. all workloads everywhere. You can say generically how the kernel should be used in all environments yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And so that requires some configuration and tuning. And so some of our customers just use like the IPS version. Mm -hmm. Some customers just use the uh, uh, you know, use both and, yeah. uh, the, but. Would an example be like um, if a uh, environment was supporting real-time uh, apps versus non-real-time, is that an example or what, I'm trying to think of what 
some of those differences might sure. be? Sure, well, uh, a good example would be, uh, you know, think of uh, like a network security policy where yeah. you wanna, uh, you know, we really try to find attacks at, while they're happening, and that's kind of our preference, but yeah. you can also do things like compare your threat feed against like inbound network connections, oh, right? And that in many workloads is a spammy, noisy, like, because you're, you're handling all these connections from all over yeah, the world. Cool. And so, do you, like, do you really want to deal with, uh, with that kind of problem? And then for file integrity monitoring, for instance, uh, you know, you might, we could have, like, if you look at something like the MITRE attack framework and it says, well, here are all these indicators of post-exploitation that mm. you should be looking for, many of those things will false a lot in a in some production environments not everybody's like for instance uh, saying well if uh, you look at the uh, you know somebody's exfiltrating data out of the Etsy shadow file mm -hmm. for instance and so that certainly could be a rule that works uh, like uh, in every environment in one company and in another company it may be that their tooling yeah. goes in and when they add a new user to the system yeah. it goes in and changes the etsy shadow or like a lot of bad apps do go in and touch etsy, etsy shadow in particular which they shouldn't right yeah. exactly and Show so bad, you know we we, we make it really easy where no one else has ever done this before to make it easy to say hey, yeah, these are the actual valid ways to do these things on yeah. the file system yeah. or on the network, but that does require some configuration as opposed to like an IPS world where, you know, we know that uh, like when somebody is like exploiting the kernel or launching a command injection attack that that's like almost certainly bad, yeah. right? And yeah. you're not gonna see a lot of falses and you don't have to do a lot to it configure it. Um, if uh, that makes sense. Now you mentioned file integrity monitoring. You yeah. guys basically have kind of reinvented or s sort of solved that that issue. You guys did a pretty good job there. Right? Yeah, the the uh, the the traditional file integrity monitoring product. We talk to a lot of enterprise customers mm -hmm. who say, "Well, I have to do it for compliance reasons." Right, it is a requirement. A lot of frameworks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, yet. We don't get any value out of it. We never use any of the alerts. Yeah. And when we drilled into why that is, it uh, turns out to be because file integrity monitoring products don't give you a lot of context for the alerts because they don't have it. The operating system doesn't provide it to them. So if you have a file integrity monitoring policy, something really common would be no executables on the system should ever change. Yeah. And that sounds pretty good until you realize that in most production environments they change all the time <laughs> because like you do a system update because you're worried about right. all the security vulnerabilities right. on that system. And then when the, the system update happens, file integrity monitoring products say like, here are 150 yeah. ding, uh, ding, executables ding, 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 that ding, got changed, changes, yeah. and your sock gets mm -hmm. flooded with 150 alerts or whatever the number is, uh, times the number of systems that you're updating, right? Mm. And so th the uh, the threat actors aren't idiots either, and they know that if they're going to make file system changes for persistence, you're bound to do an update, and they can just kind of wait for that make their changes and even if it does alert you're probably never going to notice it yeah. and uh, so we we solved that problem quite cleanly because all the uh, we create a, like the operating system doesn't provide a lot of context but we kind of get uh, like inside the internals and create that context so that we can uh, make really simple policy decisions like this is how we update our system. That's allowed to change executable files. Nothing else is allowed to. So mm -hmm. if you manage to change an executable some other way, then you know, ding, ding, ding. The, we, we know immediately there's a real problem, but we don't alert on all the times that you legitimately update your uh, your system so the remaining sense. alarms for things like executable changes would be something you can't correlate 
to a legitimate activity log or a, right. some event in a transaction log. Right. That is a good idea. I mean, it still might be some false positive. We would be way low, way, way fewer. Yeah, and, and then when you see them, you get all the context to say, well, oh, I didn't realize, I thought all our updates happened through Puppet. I see that on this kind of system, we've got Snap installed and that's doing a bunch of updates. That's okay too. And then you can essentially say if the system snap is installing stuff, that's okay too. Mm. And then you'll never see another false positive there either, if that makes sense. So there's so much context behind any alert that does come out of our policy capability that you can easily say, well, that's just my policy is not accurate enough and then go make it more mm. accurate. It's just about every enterprise now that you talk to moving their stuff to uh, workloads in the cloud. Is that is that pretty much become the de facto means for taking advantage of cloud economics? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, every f large, every media, every company we talk to is investing in the cloud. The where they are on the adoption path varies a lot by industry. Yeah. Like I'd say in a big chunk of the financial industry, they're still not as far into the cloud because of the compliance environment. Uh, I think that's an excuse. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, you, you're probably better positioned to say. I don't know either. Here, here, I think here's the challenge, like the the. Because you can carry your your, your controls, for example. Yeah. Tell me this right. Data center versus you know Kubernetes managed in the in a container somewhere. Yeah. Same thing. Like I'm checking the same boxes on my uh, PCI. Yeah, but, but a lot of it boils down to the auditor for many of these compliance frameworks. Like yeah. they have a lot of flexibility to say, here's where your bar is. And if you think of what they're all used to, <coughs> it's this big stack of appliances. And if you want to move to the cloud, they're going to say, well, what's your, uh, yeah. your replacement where's for your, your IPS controls? <laughs> and uh, yeah, where, uh, right. And, uh, but I still think you can answer that. You can, yeah. but it requires a bunch of gymnastics and could potentially put a lot of operational risk in. So until recently, there was no way on AWS to kind of tee off your traffic the mm. way you can when you own the network. Yeah. They just added this actually, but so you could put like an IPS in li like software, like in a VM somewhere, yeah, right. but you had to kind of route all your traffic through it, which means there's just a lot more operational risk. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, the appliance was never a good place to do anything anyway. You it just like the fidelity of the data was too low and it's a big part of the problem why there's this massive amount of spam sitting in the sock is because we're focused on gathering as much data as possible and looking at really low fidelity data instead of focusing on like taking our expertise on what the bad guys are doing, looking at the right data and uh, trying to get the right fidelity of data. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, you know, I think the financial institutions, they all have stuff in the cloud now, but it often tends to be the least mission critical bits where it's easier to jump the bar to yeah. say, hey, like mm -hmm. I've seen a bunch of uh, financial institutions doing like their quarterly stress testing on the cloud, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, makes sense. Yeah. Now, do you guys do any artificial intelligence in, in the uh, processing, like your algorithms have Maybe like some machine learning assisted or, or, or similar yeah. heuristics in the, in the code? Yeah, we have a pretty, uh, I'd say, complex thoughts about yeah. Uh, yeah. AI and data science. I mean, first, we think it's uh, uh, both uh, invaluable and uh, overhyped buzzword. Yeah, yin and yang. <laughs> right. 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 Uh, so, uh, Realistically, uh, there are, we, we do a lot of, you call them like static stochastic models and uh, uh, we do, uh, we st like started out experimenting a lot with online models with like kind of automated learning. And so uh, like a lot of the, in the early days we 
had a, plenty of customers that wanted to experiment with problems that uh, really only scale via learning, like, hey, the topology of my network, can you tell me when it changes in a way that I'm not expecting? Yeah. And uh, so in a kind of, th that is, it turns out to be massively noisy and uh, wasn't of uh, great value in practice to a lot of organizations. So especially in like this continuous integration, continuous deployment world, you're always pushing out new software and the topology of your network could change all the time. And then what are you even baselining against? Are you baselining against the 29 versions from the past month or are you rebaselining every day in which case you're not gonna get anything interesting anyway. Yeah, so yeah. for us, our models are things that are, I mean, right now everything is a static model and kind of universal across our customer base. And what we're trying to model is, uh, is this a bad guy or not? So you're essentially trying to model the universe of all bad guy behavior and so the 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 question is what are the features that uh, kind of correlate to potential uh, threat actor behavior and uh, the more expertise you drive into the feature extraction the better results you get so uh, i would actually say that uh, one of the things that uh, uh, most people are derisive of in the security industry are rules yeah. and uh, so we say oh yeah well that's uh, you know that sounds like a rule and in my view if I could ever get to the point where a rule was 100% accurate that's actually it's awesome awesome right the, no, the, I'm the, with the, 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 the uh, and you it, know what all these AI models yeah. a lot of them are decision trees right right and so that like that basically like Think about this though, a rule that's 100% accurate, you're basically saying I have a, a model, a, a statistical model that only needs one variable yeah. and is a completely accurate. Yeah. That actually sounds yeah. awesome. I know. The, 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 I, I go nuts when I hear uh, everybody say non-signature base. I get the problems with signatures, but they're talking about something different. Yeah, they're talking about hashes. Right, and that, 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 that that's, doesn't make sense. Right. But when there's a technique or a method, right that's common and you can spot it happening, yep. somebody needs to tell me why that's a bad thing. That yeah. seems like the goal. Yep, so I'll give you a real uh, simple example from our world. You know, you, I, you, the ideal is come up with a rule that detects something with 100% accuracy yeah. and you're probably not gonna get there because the world's too diverse a place. Yeah. Yeah. And then let's try to figure out what the features yeah. are that are gonna help us get as close to 100% as possible. Right. right, so right. just to give you a really simple example, uh, you might say, well, in most production infrastructure, th there's there are very few ways to log into a system. You know, in the old days, it, it, yeah. it, like SSH or logging in from the console, right. which would be Getty. And uh, in the modern era, it might be like Kube Control Exec or Docker Exec or something like that. Yeah. But you can make you know, a list. Of you them. can make a really small list. In any other time, there's someone yeah. logged into Some a machine. Right. Yeah. That's definitely bad. But the ambiguity there is what does it mean to be logged into a machine? So what, it, which yeah. is really like somebody's interactively logged into a machine. And so that notion, of, like you can apply your expertise on what are the indicators, like the features yeah. we could extract yeah. that say this might be interactive and then build a model of, hey, this is interactive or not so that you don't, uh, and you gotta be really err on the side of, not raising the alarm when it isn't interactive, right? Because the, like people get shells all the time as programmatically in a Linux system. So uh, you know that that's where we can really apply our expertise, build a good model, and expect that it works pretty universally. And some of, so some of our analytics are uh, essentially regression models. Some of them are graph based. It really just kind of we, we start with we are you know we can break into a bunch of things ourselves what are the things that that we kind of have to do as a matter of course it's a, like the the black hat toolbox isn't that large and so 
let's look at anything in the Black Hat toolbox and say, you know, is there a reliable, efficient way to kind of look at this stuff? Start with postulating a rule, and if that rule is 100% accurate, then you're done. And when it isn't, you say, well, what are the other things that I can correlate yeah. to kind of get the accuracy up high enough to be acceptable to us and our customers, uh, if, if that makes sense. Well, so. that's a lot of people would call that in their brochure artificial intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Right? We, we would never do that. We yeah, never do yeah. That. And, and, yeah. And I would say most security companies aren't doing that in our experience. They yeah. are, like when they say AI, they basically say we're going to let the algorithms do as much of the yeah. workforce as possible. So they don't bring any expertise to the table. They collect as much data as they mm -hmm. can and hope that like the learning will sort of bubble up some interesting yeah. things and that it doesn't work very well. I always go dig in, like with yeah. kind of clients that, or you know, vendors that come in, and yeah. technology companies that claim AI. I don't have a problem with it if when we lift the hood, it's something good. There's right. some real computer yeah, science yeah. and whatever, call it what you want. There's a marketing decision. Right. To write, a lot of times we see these real trivial um, decision logic right. kind of code that's called artificial intelligence. That seems misleading. I was I was pushed back when I see yeah. that. Even if, even a decision tree with some real probabilistic kind of decisions, that yep. seems, that doesn't seem like AI, but whatever. No, I know. Um, <laughs> hey, I want to ask you real quickly about IoT. That's an adjacency. Mm -hmm. Do you see the IoT in uh, like industrial control world adopting Linux more? Is, is Linux going to find its way into that environment? I, there are already plenty of IoT environments that are big on yeah. Linux. It's um, free. And it's easy to yeah. Easy to program. It, and yeah. uh, you have a lot of flexibility to take stuff out of the kernel that you don't yeah, want right, that right. are still kind of necessary in a lot of uh, constrained environments. So, absolutely, I think that the traditional embedded OSs like a VX works mm -hmm. are eventually going to disappear. Uh, because Linux is so well suited for that environment, especially as kind of even the embedded computing power and power utilization all improves. So, yeah. uh, you know, I think that uh, that for uh, for the security industry, uh, that's probably a big positive in the long term because it means that you know, you have to master fewer esoteric technologies to do your job well. Well, it's uh, plus or minus, like an attack can cascade. Yeah, that's fair. More, that's more, fair. Like sometimes that security through obscurity, which we both hate, Yeah. but is still present if I've got some kooky, non-interoperable thing. Right. Well, I don't like it, but it is not interoperable. Right. So, yeah. you know, a worm or, you know, something like that is not going to cascade into it. Yeah, yeah. That's how a lot of... Um, mechanized infrastructure has avoided security attacks. That frankly. is true. And again, you and I would preach, teach, and and just argue that that's a terrible way to do it. Yeah. But if you are going to go all in line, everything IP, everything running Linux or Windows, um, then you have to protect it. You can't just yeah. let it. Well, look, I, I got to say, though, that uh, for when you're on a system, whether it's a mobile system mm -hmm. or a kind of traditional like server yeah. or desktop, the assumption is that you've got a pretty large attack surface available mm -hmm. to you. It's an assumption anyway. It may not always be true, but right. uh, but it, but it's a general assumption. But when you're not on the device, you're near the device and you can access it over the network, it's much easier to get your attack surface to be pretty minuscule, yeah. especially if you've got any kind of uh, authentication authorization as the first step of communicating. Yeah. Um, which in the embedded world though, like the, the, a lot of times that doesn't even happen. You know, if you're on the same network, then come on in and do whatever you want. And, or you get uh, servers that have 11 back ends and three front ends and right. network to 80 different things. Yep. And then 
suddenly there's no choke point where you do authentication. You yeah. just got this thing that's connected to everything. Yeah. Tangled into. Yeah, and the you see that a lot in, IO, in industrial and like a factory, or like I a know. hospital. Oh yeah, hospitals are prison. scary, aren't the they? The stuff yeah. is all connected it's to just everything. A, it's just a good thing that uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of financial incentive to target them because it's generally going to be easy to get onto the networks yeah. and everything is kind of, and often to get physical access and yeah. yet everything's pretty sloppily done as we've seen some evidence of with like, you know, hacking insulin pumps and, uh, you know, pacemakers and things like Is this that. Is this a future uh, opportunity for you guys as you, as you grow? Because I know yeah. right now you're pretty busy with all the pr production Linuxes everywhere. Right. So I know you guys have been growing like crazy. Yep. Uh, but I would imagine probably even accelerate. I mean, yeah. I, look, IoT is a, a future possibility. We also yeah. have a lot more capability that we can build on top of our platform for production Linux. I would kind of consider what we've done as a security platform to replace appliances. You could call it like a software-defined security platform where we could build a lot of different things on top of uh, the, the same kind of core technology. So those yeah. are considerations too. We do have some kind of older school companies saying, well, this is really nice, but we want to buy everything from one vendor, and so can you do Windows as well? We probably won't do that one anytime soon. Uh, but you know, they're, they're, I, I think that uh, that when we POSIX is down somewhere yeah, in, the, in the middle of that, true, right? It sits it, at the bottom of you know, Windows. Fundamentally, the attacks are so different, yeah, and the I environment's understand. so different that. Uh, it's like a whole new company, and there are a lot of good companies in that space. Yeah. Um, the, so I, I think that uh, though the, that if you look like three years out, there's an explosion of possibilities mm. for directions we could end up in. Uh, while, but uh, it's hard to predict where we'll end up. I think it'll be driven by we'll be dragged into our next markets, That's not uh, kind of like pushing ourselves into them. You're good at building and running these companies. You, oh, you do a good job with it. Thanks. I, I think it's um, it's good for our industry to have people like you. A little academic background, practical. You've got the whole uh, package. You're going to still come back and talk to us when you're the next Uber for cybersecurity or, or what? <laughs> hey, uh, I'll still always talk, talk to your to you. friends. I'll always right, talk to you. Yeah. All I, right. Next time you come, you'll be in a three-piece suit with. Yeah, uh, I don't think you'll see I, that. I'm guessing not. Right, probably not. But, yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's always good to see. I'm, I appreciate you stopping by. I hope people enjoyed. Um, you know yeah, your insights. Thanks. I think they will. And uh, if they want to be in touch with you, visit your website. And, yeah. And maybe uh, you guys can help them secure their uh, Linux environment. Excellent. Thanks, Ed. It's always great to talk. Good to see you, man. Thanks you for too. coming. Thanks. And we will see you next time.